In this first episode of Apex Interviews, where we interview high-level people who are getting results in different areas of their life so that you can model that and apply it to your own life, uh, we're going to talk to Lou Kyoto. I'm honored to be able to have him on and to speak with him, with you guys. He's got a book called Winning a High-Speed Close-Distance Gunfight. He's a world-renowned firearms trainer. He's responsible for the quote that I use often, which is we don't rise to our expectations, but we fall to our level of training. This uh, is something that can actually be applied in many aspects of life, not just firearms and use of force training. But he's going to get into not just his book, but his methodology and his way of thinking. And it would do you guys well to listen to him and apply some of these principles and concepts to your own life. If you want to hear more about Lou, there's links in the descriptions. There's a link to be able to purchase his book. I recommend you do that. A uh, link to courses that he does on Zoom for firearms use of force through Live Safe Academy. I recommend you look into those as well. Without further ado, Apex Mindset Interviews, Episode 1. Lou wrote a book called Winning a High Speed Close Distance Gunfight. Um, I consider Lou an authority on gunfighting. All right. So I've been, I have a lot of operational experience and I consider Lou an instructor to me. All right. So he is an authority on the topic. If I have questions or things that I want answered, despite my experiences overseas and everything, he's a guy that I call and when he talks, I listen. So Hopefully you guys will enjoy this interview. What's up, Lou? <laughs> hey, good morning, Paul. Hey, th thank you for having me. Uh, I look forward to having this chat about such an important topic here. Yeah, no, me too, man. Hey, me too. I'm glad your book's back in print too. So um, why don't you start off, just tell us a little bit about your background, you know, briefly and, and, and what brought you into the training world. Oh, sure. Well, you know, it, it, in an early age, right at about nine years old, I started to have that interest and began training in, in martial arts. It was, it was Korean martial arts at the time. You know, I'm an old guy now. That was back around 1964. Um, I, I spent my entire life doing martial arts. Um, currently, I'm a ninth degree black belt, a grandmaster, um, and I continue teaching to this day, plus, of course, doing my daily personal training. Um, that, that kind of set a tone for me pursuing uh, being a trainer, because I, I found that one, um, by my experience with martial arts, I found how important it was in my life to be able to learn about using my body, learn about coordinating my mind and body together, um, learning a fighting skill. And that kind of carried me all the way through up through high school. Uh, we were required at that point when we made black belt to have uh, students and and, and be able to teach on our own, which I did. Um, when I entered college, I was uh, accepted into a, a Marine Corps commissioning program. Um, and I spent my four years in college in that program, um, was commissioned into the Marine Corps, uh, was within two Marine divisions. Uh, I was a series commander, which is a, a position at the recruit depot where we make Marines there. So. That brought me well into the training uh, of our own our own Marines at, at that level, at, at their initial level of coming in. Um, I was a, a regular Marine officer, uh, was a captain there. Uh, when I decided to, to separate from service, I was accepted uh, into law enforcement in the uh, California Highway Patrol. Um, and, and that opened up a whole nother door of training uh, because one had martial arts now I, I, I spent a, a total of 10 years immersed into Marine Corps training. And then now I find myself in a law enforcement community. And first, of course, as a student, being a cadet, like everybody else starts. But then as I progressed through my career, uh, pretty much right off the bat, I was given a range master uh, duties and also uh, officer survival training uh, duties as, as instructors. And 
that kind of carried me through my entire career of about, about 23 years. And during that time, I had the opportunity to evaluate the type of training that we were doing and be able to assess its strong points, its weak points, what needed to be fixed, what needed to be included, the, the whole myriad of things that you would do as an analyst. Uh, I did go to graduate school to, to and the program was uh, to be a systems analyst. So I kind of applied that principle to the way that I was looking at our training, how we were training, what we were training, uh, tracking it in, in the field as to how it was being applied, what worked, what didn't work. And then I was given opportunities um, first at my area level with about 90 state troopers and then um, with approximately 1,200 that were within my division. And that division is spread out all over from, you know, just at the Los Angeles, Orange County city limits all the way down to the border where I am. And from the ocean, 180 miles east of us out to the Arizona border and all the way up the Colorado River to uh, Indio. So it covers a vast area with 20 different offices. Um, and I was able to bring programs within that group of people. Um, then through a, a series of incidents and, and things that happened, I was given the opportunity to go statewide with that program where now it's going on to about 7,000 people. So it wasn't only the fact of developing what training had to be done, but now I, I have to develop a system of being able to get it to these people because we're spread out you know, you, you know how big California is. Yeah. So we're, we're spread out in a hundred different offices statewide. Mm -hmm. So I had to develop a plan of action to create an instructor cadre of approximately 240 instructors. All of, all of the logistics that would go into basically taking the book that we were training, throwing it in the trash can, and then reinventing an entire system of training that right. had to go out to 7,000 people. Mm. So, you know, th these are the type of things that I have done over the course of spanning from when I was nine years old back there in Rhode Island, where I grew up, you know, through my time out here and, you know, and, and going to retirement in the highway patrol. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love it. And I, I love like how you, your thought process, like I've, I've, I've listened to you before, you know, I've, I've been actually, I started doing uh, those uh, seminars through Ian uh, with you prior to me even getting in the military. And what I liked about it is it set up my mental framework for when I would go into the military and even in the special operations community, because there's a lot of stuff that even in the DOD and even with high level trainers that get taught that need to be challenged. You know what I mean? They don't apply too well to actual gunfights. And actual real life encounters and i'm sure when you were chat and, and i like how you were able to challenge the training that existed when you got there and develop methods that made more sense and applied more to the actual well, well gunfighting but um what were some of the things that you notice back then as well as today you know we just kind of just talk about it that are kind of mistakes we would call it in training and and some improvements that you you've you've uh, been able to uh, implement in, your, in what you do and, and well, that you cover in the book too. Well, great, great. It's a great topic because it's really at the essence of what needs to be done for anybody that's training in anything is the first step is you always have to analyze what you're doing. Right. And what, what I found was that some of the things that were in the system and in, in not only in what we were doing, but, but I've got exposure along a very, very wide and deep uh, uh, training in, in various places within the country. I've gone to a lot of different schools myself. I've seen the way a lot of people are teaching. I see the methodologies that are being professed. And the problem is, is that a lot of these methodologies are never analyzed from the standpoint that do they even work in the environment where they have to be applied? Right. And this is critical. Yeah. Because you can go out there and train your heart out. You can spend tens of thousands of, of rounds downrange. You can practice whatever you're doing. We see this in the martial arts community. People spending, you know, li literally sometimes even decades 
practicing things that don't work. Never get the opportunity to ever really apply it in the environment where it was made to be actually utilized. But in their minds, they think this is what needs to be done. <coughs> right. And then, unfortunately, for many people, and we see this in the law enforcement community, I'm sure we see it in the military community, you see it in the civilian community, that the first time people go to apply whatever that they've been doing, it falls flat on its face and they get hurt or they get killed. Right. And, and, and the, you, you've got to start somewhere. And the essence of what, I'm, what, what I've written in this book is to push people towards, hey, let, let's look at what we're doing at least to see if it applies to where we're going with it. If, right. if you're teaching me a method of shooting, let's say, just using that as an example, yep. that is designed and in, in, in professed and taught the way we would teach someone that is behind a bolt action sniper rifle at 800 meters from someone, and you're telling me that that methodology is going to work when I'm 15 feet from someone that already has a handgun in their hand and is looking to kill me. Right. And the dynamics of what happens in the second environment where we're close to someone is going to be completely different from when you're at a distance, you have time, you have cover, you have all the things working for you that make it work in your favor. Right. Nothing works in your favor when someone's pointing a gun at you and projecting rounds on you in close quarters with them. The only, the only way you're going to walk away from that is something has had to have been plugged into you that absolutely works there. Mm -hmm. We get into it in the book about how the sympathetic, ner sympathetic nervous system affects the way that your mind and body works on the high stress. Well, well, if, if I'm developing a program to teach people how to utilize, let's say, a handgun, and handguns, for the most part, we use for very close quartered work because that's what they really were designed to be used for. Right. They're not sniper rifles. They're not designed to be out there plinking at people at 80, 90 yards. It doesn't mean that they can't be, it can't be done, but in reality, that, that's not what we see done. Mm -hmm. So the methodology I have to develop has to work for the person at the moment when it's needed. And if I teach them anything different from that, I'm teaching them to get killed. And it's yeah. a strong statement, but, but I've made this statement before in many places, is that sometimes people are trained to die. Because yeah, because the manner the manner in which they're being taught to do things is destined to fall flat on its face, and and there's really not much that's going to be done. If I try to take a, a person, and I'm trying to teach them how to manipulate a trigger in a close quartered fight with someone, where we see rates of fire at four to five shots a second, in reality, yeah, and now you can go on YouTube and all these places, and you can see this stuff real time. Mm -hmm. and you can get your stopwatch out and you can time this stuff and you can see how long it takes to put out those rounds. Well, if I take someone in a training class and I tell them, hey, you know, you're going to have to breathe, relax, aim, slack, squeeze and relax. <laughs> and you're going to be manipulating this trigger to where when it goes off, you're going to be surprised. They call that the compressed surprise break. Yeah. Now, who in the hell in their right mind is going to think that's what's going to happen when you got live rounds projected on you from someone that's as close as five yards away from you? Right. And if I take someone in there and that's the way I'm teaching them, as I said, I'm teaching them something that's going to fall on its face. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Now, why? Uh, I, I've always wondered, like, you know, I always like looked at it. I might have some of my own theories, but. Why do you think there is such a disconnect between trainers who are training people on a range to be proficient with a firearm on the range and the actual gunfight and those training differences? You know what I mean? Like one, a lot of stuff oh, I, I, on the range doesn't apply to the gunfight. And w why do you think there is that disconnect with these trainers and they don't, they're not willing to see that, that the disconnect is there? Right. Wow, that's what a great question. And, and, and I would first answer that really bluntly by saying they can't get their head and ass off that range and put themselves into right. an actual gunfight. Right. So right. they can start to compare what they're teaching on that range to how it's going to be applied in that gunfight. Yeah. We, we, in, in my company. And, and of course, I, I did this as part of my my duties when I was working in, in the programs I ran there. 
we we emphasized force on force training. There you go. And yep. two, there's two branches of that. One branch is drilling. Mm. Now we know this. We know this because we went through this in the military really heavily, where, where you teach people how to do things, immediate action drills. How do you respond when X happens? What's going to be our best response? And then when you develop these 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 ways of doing things, then you go out and you drill it to the point where it's done almost with, with no mental effort. Yeah. Because at the moment of, at the moment of truth, when live bullets are in the air. There's not much thinking going to be done there. There's going to be a lot of doing. And the doing gets done by what's been plugged up here. And then from here, plugged into your body so that the two right. of them have meshed. Right. If you haven't done that, then then there's disconnects right there. Yep. We, we, we know this. What people think they're going to get away with in their mind in a fight sometimes is, is 180 degrees out from mm -hmm. what really happens. Yeah. We see this in martial arts. People have a plan. They go in there and they think they're going to get in there and do X, Y, or Z, but they forget there's a guy on the other side that's thinking the same thing, and he's going to be doing things that's going to interrupt that cycle. Mm -hmm. So we, we use this force-on-force -force training drills to teach people how to take methodologies that we teach them and then apply them towards gunfighting. Th this doesn't involve one shot fired on a range. Mm -hmm. We usually use airsoft gear because airsoft gear is cheaper. Right. And we, can, we can do thousands of repetitions with people for next to nothing as compared to going to range training. But the critical thing is, is that we can put them to where there's another person on the other side of them. And initially in set drills, they learn how to apply what we've been teaching them. Right. And I guarantee you this, if you've been teaching them bullshit, it's going to come out right off the bat. Oh, sure. Yep. And, and you know this because we've done training stuff together. And if if it's not plugged in right, it doesn't come out right. That's so how you that find out. One, yeah. <laughs> that's one <laughs> avenue that we take to, to, to teach methodology and then teach them how to apply it. But mm -hmm. then there's one more step in this process of force and force, which is scenario-based training. Right. And that's where we take all these things that we've taught about immediate action drills of doing things, about the methodology of shooting to be able to combat accurately hit what we're shooting at and then we put them in unknown environments right where now they have to not only test the methodology they've been taught but they've had they have to do it in a manner at which is as close as we can physically and mentally get them to a live gunfight yeah this is the missing link that i think you were driving at in your question and why is it this happens well i right. went through a lot of programs by a lot of very well-named people Sure. And not once, not once have we done any kind of force on force training there. Right. So it, it's really it, all theory almost then. Exactly. But what it boils down to is it come it comes down to there's an academic way that people are being taught. Mm -hmm. and, and, yep. and that's not a problem because, you know, academics leads us to to where we need to go in many ways. But if the academics aren't right, in other words, if what you're being taught in that academic environment right doesn't translate into the real environment then ding there's your missing link right there sure and that, this is what we see happening yep yep well yeah this is um it's so critical to apply it to the actual scenario and to put to, to pressure trust test things rather pressure test it under the conditions as close as you can replicate them to the real situation, you know, and then see if the methods that you're doing on the range wash out in that environment. It, it's because they're you'll you know everyone, I myself included, I've trained things and I go, then we put it to a pressure test and you're like, all right, there's something wrong. I'm either doing it wrong or the method's not that good or something. You know what I mean? Something's wrong. And you really have to be able to bag your own personal ego uh with with what you've been doing. I think what happens is it's almost like when anyone has a political discussion, for example, or something, is people dig their heels in harder sometimes when they're wrong. There's a part of the brain, they've done research, which shows that things that uh, stimulate uh, instinctual survival things will cause people to 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 jump into beliefs even more. Like they, they, they latch onto their beliefs even harder because 
it, like gunfighting, you know, is we're dealing with a dangerous, threatening thing, potential loss of life. And so people ha- need to have like this confidence, you know, that they can grab on and be confident about uh, what they're doing to survive. But when, so when, when they put it to a test and find out that, okay, what you're doing is, is actually flawed and could get you killed, that brings a deep level of insecurity for people for their own survival and stuff like that. So then they, they, they a lot of times will latch on to the old methods harder, get really upset, get angry. You've probably had people in training environments get mad. You know what I mean? Cause their stuff's not working, right? It's cause they got to latch on to that, those things that are, that are in order to, to function in the world, we call it a safe world theory. You know, they got to be able to function in the world, knowing that what they're doing is working. And it, it makes it difficult for people to challenge their own methods but of course you in training as well as you know me when i have opportunity of training guys and even outside of the training environment just with what i do with apex mindset challenging people to think outside of their little box that they're in and to challenge their beliefs challenge their methods put them to the test and if they're not working don't don't keep doing the same thing that doesn't work and be upset about it or you know what i mean or latch on to that you know to to be willing to bag your ego i guess and and be able to change what you're doing which is what you've been able to do which is pretty pretty amazing that's what makes it better you know better training than somebody who's not doing that <laughs> you know what i'm saying well i i appreciate i appreciate that comment and, and you hit upon a, a word that that probably destroys n- not only the training that people get but I have to put it back on the instructors that are teaching it, and that is ego. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There, there's probably no, no, you know, we say in law enforcement, there's a lot of type A personalities. Right. Well, there's probably an advanced level of type A personality in the instructor cadres. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and there's reasons for that is because, you, you know, for you, for you to get in front of people and actually teach them anything, I don't care what topic it is. Right. You, you you're you're falling back on your own knowledge bank as to what you're professing. Yep. But the problem is, is if that knowledge bank is either flawed or incomplete as a teacher, as yes. an instructor, then that's going to manifest itself in the way that you're teaching and what you teach the people that are downwind of you, so to speak. Right. And, and this is what this is what I found. And, and again, I'm not trying to be too overly critical, but one thing I learned as, as a instructor, I learned as a master, and of course, as a grandmaster now in, in, in my martial arts system, is the one thing I've always taught the masters I've, I've mentored and any of the black belts that I, I've brought along is don't blame your students for your inadequacies of teaching. That true. Absolutely. If, you, if, if if you're going to look at them and blame them when something goes wrong, then you better have fingers pointing back at you and you better analyze exactly what you did with them in training yep. before you will criticize how they applied that training. Yeah. And if your training is incomplete, don't blame them. That's right. on that's on the person doing the training. And if your ego doesn't allow you to expand your mind to mm. learn more, you know, I, I've been doing martial arts 58 years. I consider myself a student. Yeah. I'm a perpetual student. When, when it comes to this topic that we're talking about, my my mind and ears are wide open because you know this because you, you see different equipment come online. You see different things that come online over the years. Right. And if you close your mind to this, then that's stuff that you're never going to get an opportunity to really analyze to say, okay, maybe this might be a little bit better yeah or maybe if i use this piece of gear integrated in what i'm doing it might make me a better fighter right right and when, once you close your mind to this stuff then you've closed your mind not only as a person but by god if you're teaching anything you you've just shortchanged your students yeah and, yeah. and that's a that's a bad thing to have happen no, agreed, agreed. Well, I steal a quote from you all the time. I use it. It's called <laughs> that we we don't rise to our uh, expectations; we fall to our level of training. Um, if I'm saying that quote right, <laughs> like, well, well, you are, and, and I I could add one more <laughs> into that, and that is is, is one of, one that I I always use in in training, is that our goal is to perfect simplicity. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Right. Because that's cool. in in gunfighting, there's nothing complex that happens there. 
Yep, true. And, and what you have to do, you know, I, I, I could probably throw this in. A lot of times people ask, well, what, what, what's the difference between, let's say, maybe a regular unit and one of the more high-speed units and whatever one it might be? Mm-hmm. And it's not that they're getting any big revelation of big things. Is what they're doing is they're taking those simple things yep. and they're drilling it to the point of perfection mm-hmm. so that they can roll out of bed, grab their weapon, and employ whatever they've been taught perfectly. Yeah. <clears throat> And, that's, and that, that's really the goal of training. So when you step into things that are required to link your mind and body together, right? whether it's defensive tactics, martial arts, combat shooting, and someone standing in front of you showing you something that's complicated to do, that's probably something that's going to fail when it's really needed. Yeah. Because one, people don't have enough time to, to, to train to the level of taking some of these very complex things to do and actually make it work. Mm-hmm. So the training time is not there, but even, even when I, you know, I'm sure you've seen this. I mean, you, I'm sure you've seen it in your martial arts background. You've seen it in the military, right? And complex things fall on their face real quick. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes. And, they and, do. and you know, and when you're dealing with bullets in the air or you're dealing with people trying to stick knives in you or hit you in the head with a blunt object, there's no time for failure. It, right. It's either going to get done right that second, or you're going to probably pay a real heavy price for it. Yeah. And if you haven't been properly prepared to work in that environment, you're going to have big problems. A lot of the officers over the years that I've seen that get killed, get killed for that very reason. Yeah. No. And, and it, you know, it's lack of training time and it's overly complex things that they've been taught whether it's defensive tactics, control techniques, handcuffing techniques, shooting. It's all under that same umbrella that if it's not simple, it it don't work when, you know, I mean, an example, if you're trying to do a complex cuffing technique after you've been in a eight or nine minute fight with someone, when you got 20 extra pounds of gear on, and maybe some of the guys might not be in the best physical condition that you'd really want to be in doing that, and maybe anyway. the guy that you're fighting is just come out of one of the prison systems and is pretty good shape and maybe hardcore at that. Um, that's not the time to be trying to do something complex with them. It isn't going to work. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right, right, right. Why well, make your job uh, harder and more risky? And yeah. uh, it's, it's so true. And, I, you know, because a lot of what I deal with um, in my channel with clients is relationship dynamics and relationship psychology. And it's great. You know, we got evolutionary psychology, how men and women think differently. And we, you know, get all into this detail and stuff. But the real application, handling an argument or a conflict with your wife, for example, or whatever, boils down to some really simple concepts. And so, like, you have to be able to take all this stuff that's out there, okay, deduce it to what's practical and what actually applies. And some of that means rehearsing those things, right? Some of that means, you know, actually training it and thinking about it in, in not just in theory, but in practice. And that's the biggest uh, difference between what you're doing and what a lot of people, other people are doing. A lot of people get really passionate about their, their little thing, their little niche, like, oh, I'm really into guns. And they get really passionate about theory, but then they, they forget to take it down and perfect simplicity, as you say. You know, just, just put it right down into this scenario and figure out the simplest solution to this problem that's going that you can actually effectively execute we call it a results-based right results-based approach get the results that's the thing so well and that's that's perfect you know that 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 mentality that you've just professed can be applied to anything that you do and that's the beauty of it it's it's not a a one-sided thing that you're just you know, in, in one little piece of it's not just guns, stuff. it's everything. <laughs> yeah. It, it's yeah. everything. We we go through, you know, I, I I see this in some of this conflict resolution stuff in, in modern law enforcement mm-hmm. that I'm I'm seeing just leads to a lot of more physical confrontations and more more problems than what it's solving. Because mm-hmm. it's pretty simple. If you have authority, you ask someone to do something, if they can't comply with it, you tell them to do it. And if they can't do it after that, then you make it happen and you make them do it. Yeah. Now, those are three very simple concepts <laughs> right. that anybody working should be following 
yeah. as opposed to standing there <laughs> and doing a half hour argument with someone on, on the shoulder of a freeway or on a surface street where it can be dangerous. Like I lost friends that got run over, you know, because of people not paying attention. Sure. Well, we're not going to stand there and argue with someone for 15 minutes over something that, you know, sorry, but if I have authority to do something, then I'm going to, I'm telling you that I want you to do something, not because it's for me, but it's my authority in whatever job that I'm doing there. Right. And if you want to stand there and argue with me, then I have to use that authority to kind of end it. Right. Yep. That's conflict resolution is ending something that starts and do it in the best way possible. All right. So, you know, but, but that boils down to a simple concept, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're not trying to be a psychologist. You're not trying to psychoanalyze what's there. I'm yep. not trying to get in the head of whoever's there. I have an objective. My objective is to done. get X, Y, Z done, do my job. And I want to do that as simple as I can and as rapidly as I can and beyond what, with whatever other things I have to do. Yeah. So that, that mentality has to kind of per permeate in everything. If you're training anybody in anything and, and it doesn't have to have anything to, to do with guns, you have to take yourself out of your head and put yourself into the head of the student. Right. Yeah. Because everybody isn't you. They don't have your understanding of it. It's your responsibility to make it simple for them so that they can understand it. Yep. Absolutely. And it don't matter what you're teaching them. Right. Yep. And so I kind of want to get into really probably the a question I want to leave off with because so part of my guys that come to me uh, for help and they come to my channel, a lot most of them are males, men trying to become better men, trying to become more confident, more alpha, just a better version of themselves. And one thing I always say, which is why I always circle back to these topics, even though my channel seems to be focused elsewhere, um, I always focus, circle back to the idea of self-defense because I think it's really important uh, for a man, just as on an instinctual level, to be able to be lethal. That doesn't mean he's going to win every cage fight with somebody, but what it does mean is that he would pose a serious problem to anybody who would attack him or assault him or try to make him a victim. He is not going to become be a victim. He is going to pose a problem to other threats. I uh, saw this uh, in the Animal Kingdom watching some documentaries where when the leopard got separated from the other leopards chasing after some buffalo, um, the one leopard cornered a smaller buffalo. He could have jumped on him and attacked, but he didn't do it. He didn't do it because he didn't have his friends with him because he knew that that buffalo posed too much of a, a risk or a threat to him by himself. Now, we put the buffalo and the leopard in a cage or of some sort and said and made him fight it out, the leopard would win. But he'd probably win with some injuries and some serious problems, and the leopard might not win. He actually might get himself killed in that encounter. And so, too big of a risk. And so... A lot of guys come to this all or nothing fallacy or mentality. Oh, I'm in my 50s. I'm not in my 20s anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to be in tip top shape. I'm never going to be in a cage fight. So why should I train stuff? Why should I do stuff? Or, oh, we, here's we have this really accomplished uh, law enforcement and military guy, you know, talking about gunfighting. How, how am I as a regular person who just bought my a pistol recently going to be at that level well they don't need to be at that level they need to be lethal to anyone that would be a threat to them but i just wanted to ask you uh, from the book now so that's a whole lot of monologue there but i want to ask you the question is uh the book winning high speed closed distance gunfight is this a good book for everybody i think the answer is yes but explain how it would be a good for somebody who just started learning how to shoot why sure. should they pick this book up well, what, what a great question. And, and, and I, I would have to answer that by, by saying the book isn't a how-to book. Right. The book is designed to take the various components that make up, let's say, programs. Yeah. And, and give you tools to be able to analyze what you're doing in training so that the end result is, is that you don't have a training failure based on doing things that were destined to fail by, by their design. Right. So by being analytical about it, even if you don't have a lot of experience, you do have life experience. Right. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you know, 
whatever that some total of experiences can be. Sure. You, it may be something as simple as you understanding, well, maybe when was the last time that I was confronted with something that scared the living hell out of me? And my heart started racing. My vision started to get narrow. I, I could feel that, you know, I felt that tension in my body. Well, hell, this is a sympathetic nervous system. Right. Right. Well, in, in the book, we discuss, well, how does this affect you as an individual? And then how does it affect your ability to apply training? Right. So let's say if you're, you know, if you're a new person looking to learn how to shoot a handgun for self-defense, not to go into a match, not to go shoot at something 75 yards away, but when you're at home and someone kicks in your front door and they're going to be 12 feet, 15 feet from you, is the training that you're doing under those adverse conditions going to be able to be effective in that environment? Right. Even the fact that you're going to probably feel if you're a normal human being in the middle of the night when someone comes crashing through your door or you're in a parking lot going to your car and all of a sudden you're confronted, there's certain mental and physical things that are going to happen via this sympathetic nervous system yep. that could potentially cancel out the way that you've been trained. Mm. Yep. And, and in this book, what I'm trying to get people to do is to analyze their training based on these things that I'm outlining in it to see if these boxes are being checked to say that what I'm I'm doing is actually valid for what I'm looking for. You don't yeah. need to be able to go hit a six inch circle at 50 yards to be able to say that you've learned to defend yourself within the confines of your house right. or, or, or where we find that most of these confrontations happen are somewhere between, you know, contact distance, body to body out to maybe about five yards. That, right. That's where if you're a civilian, that's probably where, you know, the vast majority of any of your shootings are going to happen are going to happen right there. Yeah. And it's going to happen when you're probably least expecting it, which means you probably have the most dramatic activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Right. And, and whatever, whatever you do in applying your training has to be what works in that environment. Yeah. Yeah. Not shooting a six inch circle at 50 yards. Right. Which has got nothing to do with what's going to happen there. Yeah. And through the whole course of the book, I'm laying this out so mm -hmm. that people will have tools to analyze their training. Love it. That's so critical. And, and, to, and, and to, to, to kind of piggyback on, on, on what you're doing in, in, in your, your process. If you apply this type of thought process to anything that you're doing. Right. You're That's better. why I love it so much. That's why I'm glad to have you on here for this. Yeah. You, you're yeah. going to become better at whatever you're doing because you're going to develop an analytical mind. That is, yep. And right there, that is exactly the lesson that's so important. This is why people need to pick the book up, whether they've been shooting for two decades or whether it's the first time they've ever picked up a firearm, having the ability to analyze what you're actually doing, crit critically think, and think about the results you're trying to get in the environment you're, you're needing to get those results in and being able to challenge these different training programs that these guys are going to take. So take the local CPL or, you know, CCW course, you know, and, and the guy's going to say things in that, in that environment. Some of those things are going to be okay or good maybe for the gunfight and some might not be. And so it's just like being able to analyze it, choose instructors, choose a methodology to learn, you know, the, at the end of the day, the individual is responsible for himself, him or herself in defending him or herself. Nobody else is going to take on that responsibility. And so that means you're each individual watching, you guys are responsible for your own training. If you make a mistake in what you choose to train and who you choose to train with, because you can't critically think, you're going to reap the reper repercussions of that uh, mistake. And it might be at the, at a, at a time and a place where you might not make it out of that. You know, it, it might be a lethal mistake. We don't want that. So people listening, get the book, read it, learn how to analyze and critically think through what you're actually doing through training and then take that process 
and apply it to other areas of your life, you'll it, you'll find how tremendous it is. That's one thing like I, I apply. I like I say use that quote all the time, and I've said it just in like chats. I don't think like in videos and stuff. I don't think people pick up on it. So hopefully they will now because I got you on here. I learned this stuff from you. And when you first wrote that book, I don't know, it was what, 15 years ago? I, I, it was a long time ago. And then I started learning psychology and I st- applied that same critical thinking principle to relationship psychology, to performance psychology. Because there's a lot of stuff out there that's theory that doesn't really pan out for results later in the circumstances you need them in. And so using that same methodology and that same analysis to something that wasn't even self-defense or gunfighting helped me tremendously. And it helps a lot of guys out that come to me in consultation. So I want to say thank you. And thank you for doing the work you do. I really appreciate you. And it was great having you on, man. Well, thank you for having me on. And and I, I can only hope because that's what I do this for that whoever is listening, get something out of it that they can apply to their life. Awesome. All right, guys. Thanks for the support. Like, subscribe, share the video, and I'll catch you later.